Philip, with the development of biology, particularly evolutionary biology, and seeing everything with an evolutionary eye, uh, there, there have been tendencies uh, to project onto uh, normative approaches to human uh, society from biological ones. Uh, and we've seen this in sociobiology, we see it in eugenics, which has obviously been very, um, very uh, dastardly uh, approached in, in, in the previous century. And uh, you've looked at this whole area about what are the implications of real facts in biology as it applies to human behavior, human sociology, and the normative things that we should be doing. So address those issues. Well, they're two different. There are very, the two different programs. There is the, the sort of sociobiological, evolutionary, psychological program in which uh, it seems to me a very crude approach to evolutionary theorizing is taken to generate conclusions about human nature. And from the mid-1980s on, I have been trying to argue against doing that, uh, making up plausible or semi-plausible stories and not, not really meeting the standard criteria for doing good evolutionary theorizing, which would hold in sort of if you were theorizing about ants, for example, hmm. uh, and applying those to very complex human phenomena. And I think um, the history of this is that so human sociobiology sort of ran from about the mid 70s to about the mid 80s. And then there was a, a bit of criticism of hmm. which I was a part. Right. And um, then uh, there was a sort of rethink and then one group of, of investigators, the evolutionary anthropologists, sort of took the lessons to heart and went about trying to do things um, in a more rigorous way. And another group, the evolutionary psychologists, <laughs> said, oh, well, maybe we, can, maybe we can sort of rebuild some of this. And I think some of the things that have gone on in the name of evolutionary psychology have been just rep repetitions of the old mistakes. <laughs> Although, I, I mean, there are, there are some trends in evolutionary psychology, and I, I think of the work of somebody like Daniel Nettle at the University of Newcastle in Britain, um, who does very, very serious evolutionary theorizing about human behavior. The eugenics case is rather different. I mean, there the argument was um, sort of, uh, I mean, sometimes well-intentioned, the idea of shaping the hu future human population in the light of genetic knowledge. And the trouble at the beginning was very largely caused by the fact that people were far too quick to make judgments about genetic bases for all sorts of socially mm -hmm. undesirable traits. And on that basis, not only did women get sterilized, you know, they were feeble-minded. Justice Holmes's famous judgment Three generations of imbeciles is enough. Mm. It's a chilling judgment. But even worse than that was the use of uh, alleged sort of measures of genetic um, sort of bases for intelligence that were then used in denying people asylum in the United States. Mm. Tests that were used at the um, at, in allowing immigration, and so on and so forth. So all of this has done profoundly awful work. The trouble is that we now know a lot more about genomes. And that means that parents, prospective parents, women who are you know, pregnant, can have genetic tests run on their offspring. And those things can prevent a great deal of suffering and misery and harm. And we should go forward by letting the people most intimately involved in that make decisions about whether they want to continue a pregnancy. It's appalling if distant authorities rule in a way that prevents them from using these kinds of results to avoid inflicting suffering not only on themselves and the children they may already have and on their families, but on a baby whose life will be short, painful, 
miserable and completely undeveloped. I mean, this is, this is a, a terrible thing for a, a couple to learn, of course, really is. And, and, and it leads to agonizing um, decisions. I don't want to th disclaim that, that these things are always open and shut cases. I mean, there are extreme cases in which the test results seem to me to make any compassionate person want to terminate a pregnancy. But there are other cases in which, you know, people, well-meaning people might, might go either way. But I think the really important thing here is that we've been given a tool to practice something like eugenics. I mm. once wrote a chapter called Inescapable Eugenics. Mm. And we have to learn socially how to put that decision in the hands of the right people. And we have to try to help the people to make the best moral and ethical decisions that they can. Is the distinction you're making uh, between the old eugenics when it was uh, uh, instituted by the state or by authorities and uh, terminating abortion for a, what would obviously be a, a, a deformed or, or uh, genetically compromised baby, uh, the difference between third parties in an authority making the decision and the people most intimately associated with that baby making the decision. Is that the key distinction? That is a key distinction, but another key distinction is simply not getting um, sort of overly hubristic about, the, about what you know about the genetic basis. I mean, what went wrong uh, in the early phases of the eugenics movement, um, you know, the eugenics record office at what is now Cold Spring Harbor, um, that office th was incredibly overconfident about mm. identifying genetic bases for mm. things. Um, some of them were absurd, like the search for a gene for thalassophilia, which is a gene that uh, if you have the wrong allele causes you to run away as a teenage boy <laughs> and, and go and join, you know, go, become a sailor. Right? <laughs> Love of the sea. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, so we can be amused about that, but we can't be amused about the alleged genetic bases of, of sort of social deviance or, um, or sort of uh, criminal behavior or feeble-mindedness. And those things did profound amounts of harm, mm. absolutely. The genetic knowledge we have now is much more reliable and it's potentially an enormous force for good. And I'd like to see it used that way. 